Um, so now let me come to, um, as I said, my reflections about uh, the development of this society, uh, which are also reflections, um, in a way, on the development of our movement, so to speak. Um, uh, when I first in, envisioned uh, the idea of the society uh, more than 10 years ago, and uh, at that time still a society without a name, I had uh, personal experience with only two other societies from which I could learn. My first experience was with the Mont Pelerin Society, which Friedrich Hayek founded in 1947. Um, during the 1990s, I was three times invited as a speaker to uh, Mont Pelerin meetings in Cannes, in Cape Town, and in Barcelona, and each time uh, with papers attacking democracy and egalitarianism and defending monarchies versus democracies and eviscerating the classical liberal idea of a minimal state as a self-contradictory thing and propagating instead um, a stateless anarcho-capitalist natural order. My appearance was considered somewhat scandalous, um, that is too irreverent, too confrontational and also too sensational. Now whatever the function of the MPS may have been in the immediate aftermath of World War II, at the time of my encounter with it, I did not find it particularly to my liking. To be sure, I met many bright and interesting people there, but essentially Mont Pelerin meetings were junkets for free market and so-called limited think tank and foundation staffers. There are various professorial affiliates and protégés and the principal donor financiers of it all, mostly from the United States and more specifically from Washington DC. Characteristically, Ed Feuerner, the longtime president of the Heritage Foundation, the major uh, Republican Party think tank and intellectual shill to the welfare, warfare state politics of every Republican government administration from Reagan to Bush Jr. is a former MPS president and more significantly he has been its longtime treasurer. There had been skepticism concerning the Mont Pelerin Society from the very beginning. Ludwig von Mises, Hayek's teacher and friend, had expressed severe doubt concerning Hayek's plan simply in view of Hayek's initial invitees. How could a society filled with certified state interventionists promote the goal of a free and prosperous commonwealth? Despite his initial reservations, however, Mises did become a founding member of the MPS, yet his prediction turned out correct. Famously, at an early Mont Pelerin meeting, Mises would walk out denouncing speakers and panelists as a bunch of socialists. Essentially, this was also my first impression when I came in contact with the Mont Pelerin Society, and this impression has been confirmed since. The Mont Pelerin Society is a society in which every right-wing social democrat can feel at home. True, occasionally a few strange birds are invited to speak, but the meetings are dominated and the range of acceptable discourse is delineated by certified state interventionists, by the heads of government-funded or connected foundations and think tanks, by central bank payrollees, by paper money enthusiasts, and assorted international educrats and researchocrats in and out of government. No discussion in the hallowed halls of the MPS of US imperialism or the Bush war crimes, for instance, or of the financial crimes committed by the Federal Reserve, and no discussion of any sensitive race issue, of course. Not all of this can be blamed on Hayek. He had increasingly lost control of the MPS already long before his death in 1992. But then, 
Hayek did have much to do with what the MPS had become. For, as Mises could have known already then, and as would become apparent at least or at last uh, in 1960 with the publication of Hayek's Constitution of Liberty, Hayek himself was a proven interventionist. In the third part of his famous book, Constitution of Liberty, Hayek had laid out a plan for a free society so riddled with interventionist designs that every moderate social democrat of the Scandinavian-German variety could easily subscribe. When, at the occasion of Hayek's 80th birthday in 1979, the then Social Democratic Chancellor of West Germany, Helmut Schmidt, sent Hayek a congratulatory uh, note proclaiming, we are all Hayekians now, this was not an empty phrase. It was true, and Schmidt really meant it. Schmidt was a uh, trained economist, by the way. What I came to realize then was this. The deplorable development, as judged from a classical liberal vantage point, of the MPS was not an accident. Rather, it was the necessary consequence of a fundamental theoretical flaw committed not only by Hayek, but ultimately also by Mises with his idea of a minimal state. This flaw did not merely afflict the Mont Pelerin society, it afflicted the entire limited government think tank industry that had sprung up as its offspring since the 1960s throughout the Western US dominated world and for which the Mont Pelerin Society had assumed the function of some sort of international. The goal of limited or constitutional government that Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, James Buchanan and other MPS Grandes had tried to promote and that every free market think tank today proclaims as its goal is an impossible goal, much like it is an impossible goal to try squaring the circle. You cannot first establish a territorial monopoly of law and order and then expect that this monopolist will not make use of this awesome privilege of legislating in its own favor. And likewise, you cannot establish a territorial monopoly of paper money production and then expect that the monopolist will not use its power of printing up ever more money. Limiting the power of the state, once it has been granted a territorial monopoly of legislation, is impossible. Uh, it is a self-contradictory goal. To believe that it is possible to limit government power other than by subjecting it to competition, that is, by not allowing monopoly privileges of any kind to arise in the first place, is to assume that the nature of man changes as a result of the establishment of government. Very much like the miraculous transformation of man that socialists believe to happen with the onset of socialism. That is, the whole thing limited government is an illusionary goal. To believe it to be possible is to believe in miracles. The strategy of Hayek and the Mont Pelerin Society then had to fail. Instead of helping to reform or liberalize the Western states, as they intended or maybe only pretended to do, the Mont Pelerin Society and the international limited government think tank industry would become an integral part of a continuously expanding welfare warfare state system. Indicators of this verdict abound. The typical location of the think tanks is in or near the capital city, most prominently, of course, in Washington, D.C., because their principal addressee is the central government. They react to measures and announcements of government and they suggest and make proposals to government. Most contacts of think tankers outside their own institution are with politicians, government bureaucrats, lobbyists, assorted staffers and assistants. Along with connected journalists, these are also the regular attendees of their conferences, briefings, receptions and cocktail parties. 
There is a steady exchange of personnel between think tanks and governments. And the leaders of the limited government industry are frequently themselves prominent members of the power elite and the ruling class. Most indicative of all, for decades, the limited government movement has been a growth industry. Um, its annual expenditures uh, currently run in the hundreds of millions of dollars and billions of dollars likely have been spent in total since these uh, institutions came into existence. All the while, state expenditure never and nowhere fell, not even once, but instead always and uninterruptedly increased to ever more dizzying heights. And yet, this glaring failure of the industry to deliver the promised good of limited government is not punished but perversely rewarded with still more ample funds. The more the think tanks fail, the more money they get. The state and the free market think tank industries just live in perfect harmony with each other. They grow together in tandem. For limited government advocates such as Hayek and the entire free market think tank industry, this is obviously an embarrassment. They must try to explain it away somehow as accidental or coincidental. And they typically do so, simple, simple enough, by arguing that without their continued funding and operations, matters would have been even worse. Thus excuse then, the industry continues on as before, undisturbed by any fact or event, past or future. But the embarrassing facts are not accidental or coincidental and could have been systematically predicted if only one had a better understanding of the nature of the state and did not believe in miracles. As a territorial monopolist of legislation and the money printing press, the state has a natural tendency to grow, to use its fiat laws and its fiat money to gain increasing control of society and social institutions. With fiat laws, the state has a unique power of threatening and punishing or incentivizing and rewarding whatever it pleases. And with its fiat money, it can buy up support, bribe, and corrupt more easily than anyone else. Certainly, an extraordinary institution such as this will have the means at its disposal, legal and financial, to deal with a challenge posed by a limited government industry. Historically, the state has successfully dealt with far more formidable opponents, such as organized religion, for instance. But unlike the church or churches, however, the limited government industry is conveniently located and concentrated at or near the center of state power, and the industry's entire raison d'etre is to talk and have access to the state. That is what its donors and financiers typically expect. Yet so much the easier then was it for the state to target and effectively control this industry. The state only had to set up its own bureaucracy in charge of free market relations and lure the limited government, NGOs, non-governmental organizations with conferences, invitations, sponsorships, grants, money, and employment prospects. Without having to resort to any threats, these measures alone were sufficient to ensure compliance on the part of the free market think tank industry and its assorted intellectuals. The market demand for intellectual services is very low and fickle, and hence intellectuals can be bought up cheaply. Moreover, through its cooperation with the free market industry, the state could enhance its own legitimacy and intellectual respectability as an economically enlightened institution and thus open up still further room for state growth. Essentially, as with all so-called non-governmental organizations, the state managed to transform the limited government industry into just another vehicle for its own aggrandizement. 
What I learned from my experience with the Mont Pelerin Society then was that an entirely different strategy had to be chosen if one wanted to limit the power of the state. For socialists and social democrats, it is perfectly rational to talk and seek access to the state and to try marching through its institutions because the left wants to increase the power of the state anyway. That is, the left wants what the state is disposed to do on its own by virtue of its nature as a territorial monopolist of law and order. But the same strategy is inefficient or even counterproductive if one wants to roll the power of the state back, regardless of whether one wants to roll it back completely and establish a stateless natural order or roll it back only sharply or drastically to some glorious or golden status quo ante. In any case, this goal can only be reached if instead of talking and seeking access to the state, the state is openly ignored, avoided and disavowed and its agents and propagandists are explicitly excluded from one's proceedings. To talk to the state and include its agents and propagandists is to lend legitimacy and strength to it. To ostentatiously ignore, <laughs> avoid and disavow it and to exclude its agents and propagandists as undesirable is to withdraw consent from the state and to weaken its legitimacy. In sharp contrast to the Mont Pelerin Society and its multiple offspring then, that wanted to reform and liberalize the welfare warfare state from within by pursuing a system, system imminent strategy of change as Marxists would say, and that failed precisely for this reason and was instead co-opted by the state as part of the political establishment, my envisioned society, the PFS, was to pursue a system transcending strategy, that is, it would try to reform and hopefully ultimately revolutionize the ever more invasive welfare warfare state system from the outside, that is, through the creation of an anti-statist counterculture that would attract a steadily growing number of defectors, of intellectuals, educated laymen, and even the much sworn to man on the street away from the dominant state culture and institutions. The PFS was to be this international spearhead, the avant-garde of this intellectual counterculture. Now central to this counterculture was the insight into the perversity of the institution of a state a territorial monopolist of law and order that can make and change laws in its own favor, does not and cannot, without assuming miracles, protect life and the property of its subjects, but is and always will be a permanent danger to them, the sure road to serfdom and tyranny. Based on this insight then, the PFS was to have a twofold goal. On the one hand, Positively, it was to explain and elucidate the legal, economic, cognitive and cultural requirements and features of a free, stateless, natural order. And on the other hand, negatively, it was to unmask the state and showcase it for what it really is. An institution run by gangs of murderers, plunderers and thieves, surrounded by willing executioners, propagandists, sycophants, crooks, liars, clowns, charlatans, dupes, and useful idiots. And an institution... <laughs> and an institution that dirties and taints everything that it touches. Now, for purposes of full disclosure, I must add this. At the urging of my friend Jesus Huerta de Soto, who had been co-opted at a very young age into the Mont Pelerin Society by Hayek personally, I reluctantly applied for membership sometime in the mid-1990s. Besides Huerta de Soto, the late Arthur Selden, who was then honorary president of the Mont Pelerin Society, had endorsed my membership. Nonetheless, I was turned down 
and as I must admit, deservedly so, because I simply did not fit, fit into such a society. Now, for, from reliable sources, uh, I have been told that it was in particular Leonard Liggio, a former friend of Murray Rothbard's, who must have realized this and most vigorously opposed my membership. Seconded from the German contingent of MPS movers and shakers by Christian Vatrin. Both Ligio and Vatrin would later become MPS presidents, maybe as a reward for this. <laughs> um, my second experience with intellectual societies was with the John Randolph Club, which had been founded in 1989 by the libertarian, my mentor, Murray Rothbard, and the conservative Thomas Fleming. Um, from the outset, this society was far more to my liking. For a while, I played a leading role in the John Randolph Club, but I also played a prominent part in its breakup that occurred shortly after Rothbard's death, death in 1995, and that essentially resulted in the exit of the Rothbardian wing of the society. Nonetheless, I look back to those early John Randolph Club years with some fond, fond memories. So it is no surprise that quite a few of my old JRC buddies and comrades have also appeared here in Bodrum. Uh, Peter Brimelow, uh, Tom DiLorenzo, Paul Gottfried, Walter Block, who, because of illness of his wife, couldn't come this time, Justin Raimondo, uh, Yuri Maltsev, uh, David Gordon, and in addition I should mention my friend Joe Sobren, who had wanted to appear at our inaugural meeting but couldn't attend because of ill health. In contrast to the International Mont Pelerin Society, uh, the Randolph Club was an American society. This did not mean that the GRC, the Randolph Club, was more provincial, however, to the contrary. Not only had the Randolph Club numerous foreign members, but whereas the Mont Pelerin Society was dominated by professional economists, the Randolph Club represented a much broader interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary spectrum of intellectual interests and endeavors. On the average, foreign language proficiency among Randolph Club members ranked well above that countered in Mont Pelerin Society circles. In its habits and ways, the Mont Pelerin Society was multicultural, egalitarian, and non-discriminating. All the while, it was highly restrictive and intolerant regarding the range of permissible subjects and, the inter and of, uh, full of intellectual taboos. In sharp contrast, the Randolph Club was a decidedly bourgeois, anti-egalitarian, and discriminating society but at the same time a society far more open and tolerant intellectually, without any taboo subjects. And in addition, whereas Mont Pelerin society meetings were large and impersonal, they could exceed 500 participants, Randolph Club meetings had rarely more than 150 uh, people attending, uh, and they were small and intimate. I liked all of these aspects of the Randolph Club, I didn't much care for the venues of the meetings of the Randolph Club, typically some business hotel in the outskirts of a major city. In this regard, of course, the Mont Pelerin Society had clearly more to offer, although for a very, very stiff price. Um, but as I indicated, not all, of, uh, not all was well with the Randolph Club either, and my encounter with it also taught me a few lessons uh, on what not to imitate. The breakup, breakup of the Randolph Club shortly after Rosebart's death had partly personal reasons. Tom Fleming, the surviving principal of the club, is, to put it diplomatically, a very difficult man, uh, as everyone who has dealt with him can testify. Um, I can say more in private about this. Um, in addition, there were some organizational quarrels the meetings of the Randolph Club were or organized annually, alternating by the Center of Libertarian Studies, which represented Murray Rothbard and his men, and by the Rockford Institute, which represented Thomas Fleming and his men. Um, 
This arrangement had perhaps unavoidably led to various charges of freeloading. Uh, ultimately, however, the breakup had more fundamental reasons than just personal ones. The Randolph Club was a coalition of two distinct groups of intellectuals. On the one hand, there was a group of anarcho-capitalist Austro-libertarians led by Rosbard, mostly of economists but also of philosophers, lawyers, historians and sociologists, mostly of a more theoretical, analytical bend of mind. Uh, I was a member of this group. On the other hand was a group of writers associated with the conservative monthly Chronicles, a magazine of American culture and its editor Thomas Fleming. Paul Gottfried was a member of that group. The conservative group did not have any economists of note and generally displayed a more empirical bent of mind. Apart from historians and sociologists, it included in particular also men of letters, of philologists, literary writers and cultural critics. On the libertarian side, the cooperation with conservatives was motivated by the insight that while libertarianism might be logically compatible with many cultures, sociological, sociologically it required a conservative bourgeois core culture. The decision to form an intellectual alliance with conservatives then involved for the libertarians a double break with the establishment libertarianism as represented, for instance, by the Washington DC free market Cato Institute. This establishment libertarianism was not only theoretically in error with its commitment to the impossible goal of limited government and centralized government at that, it was also sociologically flawed with its anti-bourgeois, indeed adolescent, so-called cosmopolitan cultural message of multiculturalism and egalitarianism, of respect no authority, of live and let live, of hedonism and libertinism. The anti-establishment Austro-libertarians sought to learn more from the conservative side about the cultural requirements of a free and prosperous commonwealth. And by and large, I think they did and learned their lesson. At least, I think that I did. For the conservative side of the alliance, the cooperation with the Austrian anarcho-capitalists signified a complete break with the so-called neoconservative movement that had come to dominate organized conservatism in the United States and which was represented, for instance, by such Washington DC think tanks as the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation. The paleoconservatives, as they came to be known, uh, opposed the neoconservative goal of a highly and increasingly centralized, economically efficient welfare warfare state as incompatible with the traditional conservative core values of private property, of family and family households, um, of local communities, and of their protection. There were some points of contention between the paleocons and the libertarians on the issue of abortion and immigration, and on the definition and necessity of government. But these differences could be accommodated in agreeing that their resolution must not be attempted on the level of the central state or even some supranational institution such as the United Nations, but always on the smallest level of social organization, that is, on the level of families and of local communities. For the paleocons, the cession from a central state was not a taboo, and for the Austro-Libertarians, the session had the status of a natural human right. While establishment libertarians, such as the Cato Institute, typically treat the session as a taboo subject. Hence, cooperation with the conservatives and the libertarians was possible. Moreover, the cooperation with the Austro-libertarians was to afford the conservatives the opportunity of learning sound Austrian school economics, which was an acknowledged 
uh, gap and weakness in their own intellectual armor, especially vis-a-vis -vis their neoconservative opponents. However, with some notable exceptions, the conservative group failed to live up to these expectations. And this uh, was the ultimate reason for the breakup of the Libertarian Conservative Alliance that was accomplished with the John Randolph Club, namely that while the Libertarians were willing to learn their cultural lesson, the Conservatives did not want to learn their economics. This verdict and the consequent lesson was not immediately clear, of course. It was driven home only in the course of the events. In the case of the Randolph Club, the event had a name. It was Patrick Buchanan, um, a TV personality, commentator, syndicated columnist, best-selling book author, including some serious works on revisionist history, a very charismatic man, witty, and with great personal charm, but also a man with a deep and lasting involvement in Republican Party politics first as a Nixon speechwriter and then as a White House Director of Communications under Ronald Reagan. Pat Buchanan did not participate directly in Randolph Club meetings, but he had personal ties to several of its leading members on both sides of the club, but especially to the Chronicles group, which in included some of his closest personal advisors. And he was considered a prominent part of the countercultural movement that was represented by the Randolph Club. In 1992, Buchanan challenged then sitting President George Bush, Bush for the GOP presidential nomination. He would do so again in 1960, uh, 1996 when he challenged uh, Senator Bob Dole for the Republican nomination. And again in 2000, he would run as a presidential candidate for the Reform Party. Now, Buchanan's challenge was impressive at first, nearly upsetting Bush in the New Hampshire primary, and it initially caused considerable enthusiasm in uh, Randolph Club circles. However, in the course of Buchanan's campaign, and in reaction to it, open dissent between the two Randolph Club camps broke out regarding the correct strategy. Buchanan pursued a populist America First campaign. He wanted to talk and appeal to the so-called middle Americans who felt betrayed and dispossessed by the political elites of both parties. After the collapse of communism and the end of the Cold War, Buchanan wanted to bring all American troops back home, dissolve the NATO, leave the United Nations, and conduct a non-interventionist foreign policy, which his neoconservative enemies smeared, of course, immediately as isolationist. He wanted to cut all but economic ties to Israel in particular, and he openly criticized the un-American influence of the organized Jewish-American lobby, something that takes considerable courage in contemporary America. He wanted to eliminate all affirmative action and non-discrimination and quota laws that had pervaded all aspects of American life and which were essentially anti-white and especially anti-white male laws. In particular, he promised to end the non-discriminatory immigration policy that had resulted in the mass immigration of low-class third world people and the attendant forced integration or euphemistically multiculturalism. Further, he wanted to end the entire cultural rot coming out of Washington DC by closing down the Federal Department of Education and a multitude of other federal indoctrination agencies. But instead of emphasizing these, at that time, widely popular rightist cultural concerns, Buchanan, in the course of his campaign, increasingly intoned other economic matters and concern, concerns, all the while his, knowledge, his own knowledge of economics was rather skimpy. Concentrating on what he was worst at then, 
he increasingly advocated a leftist economic program of economic and social nationalism. He advocated tariffs to protect essential American industries and to save American jobs from unfair competition by foreigners, and he proposed to protect middle Americans by safeguarding and even expanding the already existing welfare state programs of minimum wage laws, unemployment insurance, social security, Medicaid, and Medicare. When I explained in a speech before the Randolph Club that Buchanan's rightist cultural and on the other hand his leftist economic program was theoretically inconsistent and that his strategy must consequently fail to reach its own goal, that is, that you cannot return America to cultural sanity and strengthen its families and communities and at the same time maintain the institutional pillars that are the central cause for the cultural malaise, that protectionist tariffs cannot make Americans more prosperous but less, and that a program of economic nationalism must alienate the intellectually and culturally indispensable bourgeoisie while attracting the, for us and our purposes at least, useless proletariat, it almost came to an eclat. The conservative group was up in arms about this critique of one of their heroes. I had hoped that, notwithstanding feelings of friendship or personal loyalty, after some time of reflection, reason would prevail, especially after it had become clear by the ensuing events that Buchanan's strategy had also failed num numerically at the polls. I thought that the Randolph Club conservatives would sooner or later come to realize that my critique of Buchanan was an imminent critique, that is, that I had not criticized or distanced myself from the goal of the Randolph Club, uh, and presumably, presumably also Buchanan's own goal, of a conservative cultural counter-revolution, but that, based on elementary economic reasons, I had simply found the means, the strategy chosen by Buchanan to accomplish this goal unsuitable and ineffective. But nothing happened. There was no attempt to refute my arguments, nor was there any sign that one was willing to express some intellectual distance to Buchanan and his program. From this experience, I learned a twofold lesson. First, a lesson that I had already come away with from my encounter with the Mont Pelerin Society was reinforced. Do not put your trust in politicians and do not get distracted by politics. Buchanan, notwithstanding his many appealing personal qualities, was still at heart a politician who believed in government above all as a means of effecting social change. Second, and more generally, however, I learned that it is impossible to have a lasting intellectual association with people who are either unwilling or incapable of grasping principles of economics. Economics, or the logic of action, is the queen of the social sciences. It is by no means sufficient for an understanding of social reality, but it is necessary and indispensable. Without a solid grasp of economic principles, say, on the level of Henry Hazlitt's economics in one lesson. One is bound to commit serious blunders of historical explanation and interpretation. Thus, I concluded the, that the Property and Freedom Society not only had to exclude all politicians and government agents and propagandists as objects of ridicule and contempt, as emperors without clothes and the butt of all jokes, rather than objects of admiration and emulation, but it also had to exclude all economic ignoramuses. <laughs> when the JRC broke apart, this does not mean that the ideas that had inspired its formation had died out or did no longer find an audience. In fact, in the United States, a think tank dedicated to the same ideas and ideals had grown up in the meantime. The Ludwig von Mises Institute, founded in 1982 by Lou Rockwell, with Murray Rothbard as its academic head, had started out as just another limited government think tank. Although Rothbard and all other leading Mises Institute associates were themselves anarcho-capitalist Austrians. Yet by the mid-1990s, 
and I pride myself in having played an important role in this development, Lou Rockwell had transformed the Institute, which is significantly located far away from Washington, D.C., in provincial Auburn, Alabama, into the very first and only free market think tank that had openly renounced the goal of limited government as impossible and come out instead as an unabashed advocate of anarcho-capitalism, deviating thereby from a narrow, literal interpretation of its namesake of Mises, um, but um, in, uh, staying in fact true to its spirit in pursuing the rigorous Misesian praxeological method to its ultimate conclusion. This move was financially costly at first, but under Rockwell's brilliant intellectual entrepreneurship, it had eventually become an enormous success, easily outcompeting its far richer limited government libertarian rivals, such as the Cato Institute, in terms of reach and influence. Moreover, in addition to the Mises Institute, which focused more narrowly in, on economic matters, and in the wake of the disappointing experience with the Randolph Club and its breakup, Lou Rockwell had set up in 1999 an anti-state, anti-war, pro-market website, lourockwell.com, that added an interdisciplinary cultural dimension to the Austro-Libertarian enterprise and proved to be even more popular, laying the intellectual groundwork for the present Ron Paul movement. Again, a politician, however. Um, the, the Property and Freedom Society was not supposed to compete with the Mises Institute or lourockwell.com. It was not supposed to be a think tank or another publication outlet. Rather, it was to complement their and other efforts by adding yet another important component to the development of an anti-statist intellectual counterculture. What had disappeared with the breakup of the original John Randolph Club was an intellectual society dedicated to the cause. Yet every intellectual movement requires a network of personal acquaintances, of friends and comrades in arms to be successful. And for such a network to be established and grow, a regular meeting place, a society is needed. And the property, of, the property and Freedom Society was supposed to be precisely this society. I wanted to create a place where like-minded people from around the world would gather regularly in mutual encouragement and in the enjoyment of unrivaled and uncensored intellectual radicalism. The society was supposed to be international and interdisciplinary, bourgeois, by invitation only, exclusive and elitist, for the few elect who can three, see through the smoke screen put up by our ruling classes of criminals, crooks, charlatans and clowns. After our first meeting, five years ago, here at the Carrier Princess, my plan became more specific still. Inspired by the charm of the place, in its beautiful garden, I decided to adopt the model of a salon for the Property and Freedom Society in its meeting. The dictionary defines a salon as a gathering of intellectual, social, political and cultural elites under the roof of an inspiring hostess or host, partly to amuse one another and partly to refine their taste and increase their knowledge through conversation. Now, take the political out of this definition, and there you have it, what I have tried to accomplish for the last few years, together with Gülchen, my wife and fellow Misesian economist, without whose support none of this would be possible. That is to be... So what we want to be is to be hostess and host to a grand and extended annual salon and to make it, with your help, the most attractive and illustrious salon there is. And I hope and indeed I'm confident that this, our 
fifth meeting will mark another step forward towards this end. Thank you very much.